right, welcome back to Shotgun the Orcs podcast. It's Tom hosting solo again today. Hope everyone is staying safe and sane during these strange times. But we are joined today by a very special guest. She's a freelance artist and illustrator based in Nottingham who's worked with a multitude of people in hip hop. It's the extremely talented Emily Catherine of Emily Catherine Illustration. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm very well. It's really good to get you on the show. Thank you so much for asking me. I'm a huge fan, as you know. <laughs> yeah, grassroots fan. No, appreciate that. <laughs> it's nice to hear that someone's listening, so I really appreciate that. Well, it's at least me, mate. At least one. <laughs> you know, if nothing else. <laughs> exactly. So um, how's everything going in lockdown for you? I know we spoke a bit before we started recording. Um, it's great. Uh, like, it's kind of not changed the way that I do things at all because I work from home. Um, and I think I said to you that I kind of lost a load of work in the beginning and I was really panicking and then a load more work came in that was kind of based on people changing their business plans for lockdown so literally nothing's changed I just you know have put on a stone and not left the house at all <laughs> it's literally that that's definitely becoming a theme I swear honestly <laughs> I I'm like jab of the heart honestly like, I feel I like, like pushed around I my home I feel like there's two types of people. The people that have stayed in and opened a window and the COVID stone has flown in. And then there's the people that have, like, suddenly got ripped. Like, there's some people that I'm like, wow, they've lost 800 stone. They're beautiful. They've got six packs. <laughs> and then there's just me with biscuits. It's... I'm definitely not one of those people. Um, but, yeah, I think everyone suddenly, like, started training for marathons and, like, the Tour de France. Yes. Like, you go outside, everyone's just cycling and running. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's crazy at the moment. And um, mm. until obviously they find a vaccine, it's just who knows what the future has in store. But um, so in yeah. terms of in terms of like, um, you know, working from home, obviously, you, you basically paint and illustrate from from your place in Nottingham. Yeah. Um, as a creative, I guess, like, not too much has changed in terms of like what you do work wise and stuff. Right. Yeah, totally. It's totally the same, apart from the fact that I now get a million video calls rather than phone calls, <laughs> um, which, to be honest, is quite nice. Like, it's quite a nice way of doing it. The issue um, is always to do with, like, suppliers and printing. So, like, I put a halt on my website because I can't print more stuff because yeah. um, <clears throat> I can't do it at home. And most printers that I use have kind of closed down. So I'm just waiting for that to get a little bit better. But otherwise, it's exactly the same. Anything that's digital, I'm scanning all of my originals in, sending them off. So it's fine, easy. So when you, um, you know, having a lot more kind of video calls and stuff like that now, like, so I, I never really used to FaceTime before COVID. Like, I find it, like, generally, like, quite awkward, just, like, staring at the screen and it. talking to someone. Yeah, but it's become, like, <laughs> the norm now, as you say. What is like... that? <laughs> what's know, wrong bizarre, with people i don't get why they need to have a video call like even my mates <laughs> like you you know what i look like it's not like we're <laughs> never gonna see each other again you know just just ring me up it's far better and like voice notes perfect i used to leave voice notes all the time now it has to be on a video call like i was reading an article so I was starting to feel a bit down after all of these Zooms. Like you'd sort of, you'd have a Zoom and then you'd just be like, oh, I just miss that person. Like, and yeah. I, you know, and I look like a knob or whatever. <laughs> and there was a woman <laughs> who'd written an article about why constant video calling is upsetting to us. And she gave it as two reasons. She was like, first of all, well, the only reason is you can also see yourself, right? And because you can see yourself, the two reasons for that are, you either have insecurities about the way that you look, but the bigger kicker is apparently we check the video of ourselves to see if we're reacting properly to what the other person is saying, which means we're not having a normal conversation because we're constantly checking whether we're doing the right thing. So she said it's not like a pure experience of conversation because you're checking yourself. So you never really feel like you've made a point or properly had a good heart to heart. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think, like, just how technology has advanced generally over the yeah. years and now being in the information age and the way we digest information, it's almost kind of too much for yes. our brains to kind of to take sometimes. And um, 
it must have been strange before kind of you know mobile phones just going back even further like people must have been in the moment so much more um, yeah I mean I remember before mobile phones it was great <laughs> <laughs> but then again do you think you just like romanticize the past in that way because you pick and choose like what to remember and, and how to remember yeah. it yeah like we I think weirdly it's funny because if I could like if I could if mobile phones weren't little computers but we had the internet separate the internet is the thing that brings people together it's the fact that we've now got a public sphere mm-hmm. and we can speak to people all over the world and we genuinely can have friendships with those people. Um, the mobile phone issue of it kind of is like, well, you've just got a phone in your pocket. It would be easier. Like I used to have to go to a phone box at the well, And also if you lived anywhere bloody near a phone box, sometimes you'd be walking miles and chance ringing a home phone. And I can still remember my favorite people's home phone telephone numbers, you know, because you had to remember it if you got caught sure. And like, if you said, oh, you know, let's meet in town or whatever, and they didn't turn up, you'd go yeah. home. You know, it wasn't like... So yeah. People were, <laughs> people yeah, you've got like, this window. <laughs> if you don't turn up, I'm off. Yeah. That's what I mean. Like, And in a lot of ways, like, it was simpler. There was no distractions. And every... And honestly, it did make you appreciate the times that you spent with people in person. Like, really yeah. did, you know. Uh-huh. Well, I hear that. Especially now, at the moment. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the irony. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bizarre. But um, so going back to kind of where you started out um, illustrating. Mm. So what was the, you know, how did you first discover your passion for drawing? And, um, and then we'll get into the kind of the hip hop side of things later. Yeah. But, but first, going right back, how did you first get into it? Uh, when I was in primary school, I realised that I was the kid that was always asked to draw all of the other kids' pictures, you know, that kind of informal, like, you just draw it. Yeah. So I thought they thought I was good, and I loved doing it. But then I basically, I didn't, I left school before my GCSEs, um, and I was made homeless, and so I didn't get any qualifications, and then after a year um of being homeless and then getting into a hostel I went on to a GMVQ I don't know when yeah. you yeah 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 it, I know what you mean. It, yeah yeah <laughs> and it was a GMVQ in art and design um and I just I hated it I hated the theory of it I just wanted to do what I wanted to do so I kind of I got my GMVQ but then I was like well I still don't have any GCSEs um and I still and I really want to get a degree that's what I want to do I want to prove to myself that I can get a degree so over the course of like the next four or five years I basically worked full-time and did night courses and eventually got enough credits to get into university and the night courses that I tried were fine art like um loads of art history and I hated fine art hated it hated like digital graphics as well I didn't know where I fit I fitted in it was all like everything had to be abstract and I loved the theory of it like learned about the theory of color and the theory of painting and learned about loads of different artists but just with my own work it just didn't fit do you think with fine art and was it because there are too many and I, I don't know anything about painting by the way just full disclaimer but, yeah. but um <laughs> full disclosure but is that because there are too many kind of parameters or too many kind of rules applied to fine art or is it another reason why it didn't really appeal to you? Yeah, I think when I was studying, um, basically the difference between um, something, is to put it really, to really boil it down into a nutshell, they split art into good art and bad art, right? <laughs> and good art is... Um, theoretical and it is um, spontaneous expression of what you're feeling and so whatever comes out on the canvas it's not really about the product of what it looks like it's more about the journey of how the artist got there Mm -hmm. and I didn't make art for that reason I I would have something in my head that I could visualize that I wanted to put on the canvas so people were saying to me well you're not an artist then you're an illustrator and I was then like well I that's you know fine or whatever but I also don't feel I'm an illustrator because I don't have one style I don't want to be told that I can only you know just draw little things in books or whatever I want to do it all so Mm -hmm. I just didn't feel like what I wanted to do 
was valued and I kind of came away from that just thinking well I can't do that as a job because it's going to you know obviously if someone's just yeah. saying oh well you're not you know you're not yeah, yeah. you're too much of a maverick you want to do it your own way I, I respect that do you do you think like um it, what what are your what are your thoughts on the kind of uh, subjectivity of art in terms of like oh that's good art or that's bad art like what where do you kind of fall into um not your art I'm not saying if it's good or bad no, I know. But, but I mean like what's your view on that kind of argument because like mm. you go to like the Tate Modern for example and you'll see something and it won't it will make sense to someone based on what you just explained like oh this re- represents a certain feeling or emotion and the artist was like in this mindset when he did it or she did it yeah um versus something that is like objectively really really good to look at you know like a portrait or I don't know Mm -hmm. but it's weird is it where do you fall into that kind of um line of thinking it's a really old way of thinking and we do it with culture as well high and low culture high and low art and I just disagree with the whole principle of of categorization in the first place and splitting Mm -hmm. things but also it's such an old concept it's an overhang basically of when the Victorians started to categorise everything. So they started to categorise plants, art, culture, sexuality. That's when we had different terms for heterosexuality, homosexuality. That's when they did it. So it's not like you're in a situation where there's any manoeuvring for the grey area, for the fluidity of what we all consume. Like you can't just say, well, that's not that because it's not. There are a million different greys. Yeah. Now, that being said, sometimes um, a piece of art will speak to an individual for entirely different reasons for the purpose of which it was created. Mm-hmm. And that has a value in itself, which is kind of unspoken and not talked about. Like a good example of that is an artist called Jack, Jack Betriano. Have you ever heard of him? I haven't, no. Now, this dude, I don't know whether you remember, but you remember when Athena was really popular? It was a poster shop back in the 90s. Yeah, it rings a bell, yeah. Right, so Jack Vetriano posters were all the rage and they were like quite loose paintings of people like dancing on the beach or talking in a cafe and it would always be like a couple. And that dude was like sacked from university. He wasn't allowed to go and do fine art because again, like me, he wasn't considered an artist. And yeah, from like a popular culture point of view, his posters were in every household in the UK in the 90s. So at that point, are you measuring success on what the establishment think or what the public think? And that is really like the crux of it, isn't it? Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, I think that's a really good point. Um, it's always very kind of personal to who's kind of consuming the art as well. And it's just, yeah. you need to apply the right context, right? But um, yeah. no, I, I, I completely agree. Um, I guess it's just quite ignorant just to dismiss something as like being shit if you look at it and don't like it personally it's cool um, yeah 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 it's, it's just a weird one isn't it because I guess like if you're applying the same I guess thought process to music like hip-hop for example there is there there is shit hip-hop out there do you know what terrible I mean? there's, there's terrible music out there and you can I think objectively say that yeah, you know, you can. Yeah. <laughs> whereas with like a piece of art, um, I wouldn't feel as comfortable just going and saying, yeah, that was terrible w- without knowing. Do you know what I mean? It's kind oh, of Oh, really. It's still got like an overhang thing for you. Well, no, not necessarily. It's like I, I could just say that piece of art doesn't speak to me. But yeah. is, there more of, is there more of a stigma attached to saying that a piece of art is terrible than there is saying a piece of music is terrible? I'm I mean, not saying that they're not interchangeable, but let's just like mm. separate like painting and music for a, for a second. I think probably because I think people still feel that painting is a bit more cerebral, perhaps. Yeah. Like, you know, to appreciate art, you it's, a, it's considered a higher cultural consumption, isn't it, for people? So if you go and go to a gallery on a weekend, it's quite different from going to a gig. You know, yeah. people, <laughs> it feels like a bit more of a ceremonial thing that you're doing, quite more middle class. But, um, you know, I think the reality of it is it's exactly it's same shit, different toilet, isn't it? It's yeah, it's exactly the same. It's like if you don't like it, you don't like it. By the way, (laughs) I know. See, I got that in (laughs) channel 13. It's coming soon. (laughs) Yes. So obviously 
just mention Pharaoh Monch there. And um, so you got into art. Were you kind of into yeah. hip hop at the same time? Was it something that kind of like married together nicely when you kind of went down your creative journey? Or was it something you discovered later and tapped into? I think weirdly, I was into hip hop before I did started being a professional artist, definitely. Um, and when I was growing up, um, I loved hip hop and rap as a kid. Um, and then I kind of got a bit older and uh, Britpop came in. So like Oasis and Blur and it was all guitar music and I didn't really like it. Um, and all my mates at that time were just like, are you like an Oasis or Blur? And I was like, um, I'm really, I'm, um, I'm not Delete really Delete next question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> um, so at that point, I totally switched from being interested in that set of friends. And I, I kind of had a quite a lonely experience <laughs> because I was just there consuming all the hip hop. Mm -hmm. um and so I think my love for hip-hop came as a kind of really from a really early age and I just started collecting everything samples everything so then when I got older and again like because I didn't really have like a massive group of people to talk to about it um and I wasn't in a position where I could go to loads of nights and stuff it just my like kind of early adult life I wasn't going out and getting trash because I'd kind of already done that and I had like responsibilities, like I cared for my mum and all of this kind of stuff, like had yeah. jobs to do. Um, so, yeah, and then I was just like, fuck it. Basically, I got divorced and was like, I'm going to start an art business because I can do it. And I'm just going to really embrace hip hop and go out to every night and just be unashamedly in love with it. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I loved hip hop earlier than I was doing art. But basically, they've just been the only two constants. I just yeah. picked it up really late in life. Like no, you're said, living your best life now. I know, living my best <laughs> life. It's just a shame we can't go to any hip hop nights. Do you know what I mean? That's the only trouble now. I know, but, I know. Um, it will, it will come back. Um, I mean, it always does. But um, so, I mean, you've got a YouTube channel, and yeah. um, <laughs> there's a video on there I watched called "The Art of the Hip Hop Album Cover." So where you kind of orchestrated a workshop with a group of creatives and um, talked about kind of um, kind of the importance and significance of, of cover art um, yes. with hip hop and the synergies there. And then you gave everyone a task of um, replicating a three feet high and rising album cover. Yeah. So. Yeah. And it looked it looked so sick. So how did that go? <laughs> because that, that stuff like that just doesn't happen in Bournemouth. Um, oh, well, get me down. Hire me. Yeah, that's no, the, 100%. That's the key. Um, <laughs> so the whole, basically, what I'd done is I'd designed a whole course based on covers that I knew were really influential or interesting the way that they were made. Um, and I took it to um, a gallery called the New Art Exchange in Nottingham and said, could you, do you think you could help me with this? And they were really supportive. Um, and basically... I had to, I'd, I'd made too much material. So we had to break it up into different album covers and do, you know, small sessions. But yeah. the one that you watched was like a whole day where in the morning we, we heard a lecture from me and I go through really influential album covers. And I think that was like Three Feet High and Rising, Far Side's Bizarre Ride, Naz is Ilmatic, um, Lupe Fiasco's uh, Food and Liquor, Mm -hmm. And then we end with um, Stormzy's Gang Signs and Prayer because of the Last Supper element of it. And then we had a go at like making Three Feet High and Rising, literally based on how the Grey organisation made it, um, but with risograph printing, which is like a cool Japanese printing technique. Um, and then we did some graffiti, which is like the Far Side's Bizarre Rides element of it. So they kind of learned about it theoretically and who had done it and why they'd done it. And then they got a go at actually making it themselves. That was That's the whole. Such a cool concept for a day. <laughs> and um, so, like in terms of like some of your favorite hip hop album covers, um, would you yeah. say the ones you listed and included in the course are are up there for you? Because I've got I've got some here yeah. which I think are actually quite interesting. Like Please. a mix of a mix of albums which are like a bit more contemporary and some which are a little bit older. So I'm starting with one you've probably seen if you if you're familiar with the podcast. This is my yeah. MF Doom Doomsday Lunchbox. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that is just absolutely incredible. Um, and you got. <laughs> nice this is like a quest. show and tell. I'm loving this. Yeah. I just so like starting 
way back with a tribe called Quest. That's dope. Um, this is one of my favourite um, album covers of the last like few years, I'd say. And it's um, the Kids See Ghosts album cover. Okay, yes. Okay, yeah. So that's a guy called Takashi Murakami. He's a yeah, Japanese he did, artist. Yeah, he did Kanye West's, um, what's, whatchamacallit, with the little thingies. Yeah, the, he's a really yeah, good cause, artist. Yeah, cause, oh, yeah, Kanye and Kid Cudi and that. And then um, yeah, yeah. the... You've mentioned Nas. That's like the remix of yeah. Illmatic. Um, we've got the Talib Kweli um, train of thought B sides. Oh, I love I really that like, one. I really love that piece. Yeah. And then across the Atlantic, we've got uh, the Fly Hooligan. Um, hey, my yeah. boy. <laughs> um, and that album is absolutely incredible. And um, then like Verb T, a morning process. Beautiful. Yeah, so yeah, I love the nice illustration kind of, on that. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. Um, also, you've kind of you've worked with a lot of people in kind of the UK scene. You know, you've worked with Juggernaut, being like a, yeah. you know, a Nottingham head as well. And um, got this uh, cassette that you worked on of uh, Michael oh, Parkinson. Oh yeah. Of Magnum Opus. You got it. Yeah, because you did a little. Um, you did a, a, a series of short videos where yeah. you talk through how you kind of animated or illustrated each individual rapper on the front of it. Yeah, yeah. Did you want to talk a bit about that? Because I think that's... We talked about when Parky was on the podcast, it was... Um, we spoke a bit about, like, the kind of the homegrown aspect of the record and the yeah. bespoke artwork really kind of tied in with that theme as well. Yeah, so um, I tend to be... I'm completely non-digital. I will use digital to ver like tiny titan stuff up when I scan everything and send it off but I'm hand painted and hand drawn and everything and um I'm hired predominantly for that so Parky sent me the album which was totally unmixed and I we started to go through some of the themes that were in the album um and I was just saying like visually maybe you know we could think about these sorts of themes and he was like okay yeah so like from that point of view, you then start to kind of build up a layered tapestry of the things that not only feature in the album, but that represent the music. And obviously being a big fan of Parky anyway helps because I kind of know where he's coming from. Um, so it was kind of like a post-apocalyptic like launch into the future of, because he was like really wanted it to be, um, super filmic like cinematic he wanted yeah. to kind of have like a space odyssey type situation but I was like you've got so many international artists on this and they're all coming from different perspectives can we not have some kind of like representation of all the cities so you'll see the tiny little like trees and stuff and then on the back um, it's lyric it's basically painted elements of everybody's lyrics so like Jugs has got some honey soy sauce and some blueberries that he raps about. I think like Napoleon the Legend, he had like some cognac. At some point, like a little cowboy figurine turns up in one of Parky's rhymes. And so we kind of put that all the way around the edge so that you've got a representation of everybody physically on the album as well, you know, to tell you about it. That's amazing. It's so... It's so um interesting to hear like how much thought goes into the concept yeah yeah and I guess how involved you were in the conversations from like the original kind of you know idea that Parky had and what he envisioned and then as an artist you were able to say oh actually have you considered yeah. this and and kind of throw ideas off each other no I really really rate that and it's uh, yeah it's a great project as well and I think the artwork is oh, it's just so cool <laughs> thank you it's so good. it was great to do like he's one of the best kind of people to hire you because he's so open-minded, you know, he really will hear you out. If you, if you've got, if you, even if you disagree with him, he's like, okay, tell me why, you know, that's amazing to have. <laughs> he's like, you know. <laughs> Definitely. With, um, with Jugs as well, because he, he's an artist as well, isn't he? he does yeah. Incredibly talented. Yeah. Incredibly yeah. talented. And like he, he just invited to me to exhibit at his opening show and I was like wow that's so kind of you to give a platform to visual artists as well as like audio artists he's just one of those people he really unites people he's so generous um so I was like I'm gonna paint him but not tell him <laughs> 
so I just turned up with like thanks for letting me exhibit I just thought it was a celebration and he was like yes that's dope <laughs> so yeah we had loads of fun and weirdly the magnum opus I think was coming out what like the next week from that so Parky had turned up and I was like there's not it doesn't really make any sense not to exhibit the album covers here as well the original paintings he was yeah. like yes so that all just fitted together it was perfect uh, how did you link those guys originally um did you did you know them before you started working with them or how did um god how did I meet Parky do you know what I think it was all separate and then Jugs and I realized that we'll happen to all be working together <laughs> at, at some point yeah so Jugs Jugs and I didn't become close until quite recently actually um because he's a few years younger and I think we'd even gone to the same school but oh, we were friends through a mutual friend anyway um so Triple V's DJ Dan Ratomatic um his partner I'm really close to so we always knew of each other and obviously in hip hop and with Nottingham being so small, we knew of each other, but we weren't like tight, tight, like mates. So it's not like we were talking every day. Um, but then I think Parky had rung me and said, oh, I you know, really like the artwork that um, you've done for your old Droog. I was wondering how much you charge. Blah, blah, blah. And by the time that we'd got maybe a year and a half down the line, I, and you know, I've already done the artwork and then Jugs has asked me for this and, you know, Parky was asking me for that. I was like, mate, I think we were actually working with the same people on the same <laughs> thing. And he was like, oh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, sometimes things just happen like that. That's, that's incredible. So rewinding back to your old Drew then, the album cover you did for him. Yeah. So, um, yeah, how was, how was that? It was amazing. It, I mean, it took a long time. Um, yeah. But, you know, such an honour to work for someone so talented, like a real a real genius, a real wizard, and um, yeah, a master of his own sort of imagination, everything. That painting, I can't remember how many hours it was, but it was a true labor of love because I painted the front cover and the back cover on one giant canvas. Yeah. So I was, I was seeing it as a whole thing, but then we were trying to fold it over and put it on, you know, so it's that whole idea of having something physical um, but having a coherent piece of art, and that's something that he's got huge integrity for. He really respects um, the quality of art in things, as do I. So, yeah, lots and lots of detail and metaphor yeah. and storytelling and all the stuff that I love, basically. So, yeah. It's definitely a lot of kind of, yeah, correlation between the two, you know, hip hop and, and yeah, art. Yeah, you know, exactly. Um, yeah, it's just a kind of an expression of self and, and that kind of stuff. But... Um, you're on speaking terms with like Pharaoh Munch as well, aren't you? Yeah, so which is mad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's great. How, I've got to ask, how did that come about? So that was um, that's an easy answer. <laughs> I had created a print. Was it a print? Yes, I had. So mini prints of Leon. You know the film Leon. Yeah, the professional. Right. That's it. Classic. Um, and Matilda. Um, so two of these prints, and he'd messaged me saying are you going to the London show that I'm doing and I was like no I don't live anywhere near London mate I'm in Nottingham <laughs> but you are um coming to Not Nottingham um and my friend is putting on the night uh, and in fact I've already drawn a picture of you or something I've written in my blog about the fact that you're coming to support the night and he was like oh shit well will you meet me with the prints there because I'd really like to buy them off you I was like yeah no problem so we met and I gave him the prints and went into the green room or whatever it's called um, and met the Ezra Collective and all the rest of it. Gave him the prints. I went home um, and the next morning he was like, oh, I'm really sorry, but um, I've, I've lost the prints. I was like, what? <laughs> sorry, what do you mean you've lost the prints? He said, so I, I had them in the little bag that you gave me, but I don't think they got brought back to my hotel and I've got to leave. I'm going to Switzerland now. And I was like, for fuck's sake. So obviously my mate that put on the night, I was like, Ellis, what, where's the bloody prints? And he was like, I, I can't find them anywhere. I was like, Steve, do you know where the prints? Like, no. Anyway, to cut a long story short, he eventually got back to New York and I said, look, just send me your address. I'll send you some new prints. And he was like, all right. But when I got in touch with him, he had become quite ill. And I was like, oh shit, I'm really sorry. Like what's gone on? And he was like, well, I, I got pneumonia basically. 
Because he's he suffers with like asthma and stuff, asthma. doesn't he? Yeah, he spits about it quite a lot. Um, but then, but at that point, I'd also become quite ill. So, so from sick beds, I was like, "How's your illness going?" <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And oh he was my like, God, it's crazy. "Yeah, my illness is shit. How's yours?" <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're really close mates now. Um, yeah, very blessed to have him in my life. He's a great guy. Well, he's an OG. I mean, um, speaking of kind of illustrated album covers i mean the extinction agenda uh, organized confusion it's, i it's, know it's classic Absolutely i had classic. to repaint that upside down for what? the cover of it wasn't even close if you look on the table yeah of it wasn't even yeah, close yeah, i had to yeah, yeah. and i literally i was turning the canvas because it was tiny trying to get it in and just thinking how did they do it full fucking size it's so difficult amazing amazing cover did you see um or hear the uh, denzel curry project that dropped early in the year with Kenny Beats called Unlocked. No, Could, I didn't. Um, check it. But the reason I bring it up is that the album cover art is um, really, really similar. Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, is it a rip similar? Or? I don't think it's a rip. Um, but just in terms of like the palette and everything, when you look at it, it's just like, oh, I've seen that somewhere before. Um, yeah. It's a completely different image, but there's just like a similar aesthetic to there's it. There's like an aesthetic to it that's like, Reminds you of it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, no, it's um, that's crazy that you just chat casually to Ferry Monch, but he does <laughs> he does come across as a really good guy, and um, obviously he's like one of the best to do it, in my opinion. Definitely, and I think um, I think Pharaoh is one of those people that really appreciates art. Like he's an artist himself. I don't know if anyone's ever seen his photography, but he's an incredibly talented photographer. He went to art school. You know, it's not kind of a coincidence that he ends up um, producing like visual artwork and yeah. connecting with other artists that have the same sort of ideas. And like, I've worked with him on a project before and he get he totally gets it because he is so visually minded. You would think that you're not really allowed to have it all, you know. Like, oh, you can't be the best lyricist as well as you know. But he really, he really does. He's just a true, true creative to the bone. So yeah, I guess that's the same with um probably with a lot of rappers. You know, like we talked about exactly jugs and and stuff and. And his art's really, really good. And it's just kind of, his stuff's so well curated, you know, like the, the cover yeah. art, just the releases, everything just like is packaged. So it's it's very like decadent, do you know what I mean? When he puts and it that's, out. that's all him as well. Yeah. Like literally no one else. That's just him. It's phenomenal. Oh yeah, it's, it's inspiring. It's, it's fantastic. And um, I think especially as like an independent artist, um, it's kind of, you just get the impression that that's just who he is. This is like, yeah, it's completely candid. There you are. And it's like a, a kind of a visual and audio representation of, of who he is. Um, yeah. And I, that's pr it's probably common with a lot of artists, as you say, a lot of rappers, like um, he, it all goes hand in hand. There's correlations between the different things. Definitely. But, um, but yeah, Pharaoh is like, yeah, he's crazy. <laughs> he is crazy. <laughs> so, in terms of like um, who you who are you listening to right now? Are you kind of um, do you do you kind of draw inspiration from music when you're painting, or yeah. is it something that you have separately? It's a bit of a weird time to ask me because lockdown has not been kind to my cultural consumption. Um, <laughs> but in general, I think what I would say is that I'm. Um, I feel like I'm a failed DJ that has never reached her potential. Like, for me, I will curate a playlist yeah. of everything that hits right, like new stuff that I'm really into at the time, and then some really old stuff. Because when you're painting, you need peaks and troughs in the energy so that you can kind of go crazy and then have a concentration phase. Um, so when it comes to, like, new music, I'm not listening to super, super new music. Um, but... I have to say, I can't stop listening to Homeboy Sandman's Dusty. Cannot stop. Oh, I yeah. cannot stop listening to Rhapsody at all. I can't stop listening to that. It's phenomenal. That's a big album. Big. And um, and I did stay up all night to watch the verses, Erica Badu and Jill Scott. And also, <laughs> I know. <laughs> and I know that you and Jugs talked about this. Eric is one. amazing. Yeah, Eric. Did you, um, you see Tiana Taylor dropped a new album today? And, oh, really? Um, and, yeah, Erica um, 
makes an appearance on there, and uh, Lauren Hill as well. Oh, for God's sake! Uh, yeah, it's a good album. It's nice. I've only I haven't given it a proper spin yet. I just had it on in the background when I was doing a bit of work. But um, yeah, it's just like Erica's god level, god tier. She is. Me. She is. Yeah. She, she. Um, I did a painting of her as a private commission, and she saw it and she sent me a voice note. What? And all it said was thank you, but it was like thank you. You know, like Erica Badu. Huh. And I've like, I've had to record it. I was like, just play it and you record it on your phone and then send it back to me. So I've yeah, got it forever. It's back that shit up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's like the most precious thing that I own is a voice note from her. Have you got a, um, any particular album that you, you know, of hers that, um, you know, you prefer? Because I love Mama's Gun. That's probably like my favourite Erica album. So Mama's Gun used to be, but when she did Worldwide Underground 1 and 2, mm-hmm. now, especially right now, you know the interludes of like, you know, the guy that's saying like, oh, you don't even realise and the television's on all the time. They're just trying to take, like in light of everything that's happened in the past two weeks, I'm now listening to that whole album going, fucking hell. You are a, a soothsayer. Like you're so psychic and you you've known for so long how this is going you know it's like yeah amazing it's kind of coming back to life those albums for yeah. me. I'll have to go and revisit those because I haven't listened to those in a while but um yeah obviously like Badoism's like just kind of the, the nice kind of easy going yeah head nodding one Mama's Gun got a bit more kind of introspective that's why I loved the album but yeah. then again other side of the game on Badoism um is kind of one of my all-time favorite yeah tracks um because oh, who was it on? Was it Andre three thousand in that video? Because they oh, were together know. for a while, weren't they? Yeah, they were. Yeah, yeah. Was that the one where they're walking around the apartment and yeah, she's that's like, it. yeah, yes, yes, when he's really young. Yeah, it's crazy because obviously, like, Miss Jackson's about her, isn't it? Yeah. Well, like, she's the daughter. But yeah, yeah, Eric is amazing. It's um, it's so cool how, you know you get to kind of work with these people and have like interactions with them. Not, you know, obviously it's just a voice note, but that's still like, that must've meant a lot. Yeah, it did. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. You've done like a lot of, um, you've, you've done a lot of kind of big kind of portrait pieces and stuff. Yeah. Um, I I watched the time-lapse video where you, um, you did like a big, uh, portrait piece of Maya Angelou yeah that was activist. amazing that was yeah. incredible to watch it was just like <laughs> yeah it, I was just in awe of the talent it's crazy thank you I really appreciate that and the um the charity that you were um you took the commission for as well um, yeah or Bras Bras Not Bonds. Bonds. yeah yeah do you want to talk a bit more about that and is that something that you are quite in terms of like you know charities and all of that kind of stuff is that something you're quite passionate about yeah, I think, um, so particularly with Bras Not Bombs, it's a grassroots, a, a single-handed, actually, woman called Caroline Kerr, who's from Nottingham, and she raises money to get aid to refugee women and children who are in dire need of supplies, basically. Um, but she's she's also always in Calais, you know, handing out food and all the rest of it. So, and single-handedly trying to raise money for her own charity. Like, the woman's just... A, powerhouse so she'd like asked me to do that and Caroline being Caroline had said and also we'll pay you which do you know when someone's like we need to I want you to get money so I don't want you to lose money because I support artists but we're also going to raise money so the whole thing was just you know that she's coming from a real place of like love for for people yeah anyway so and that's still going. Anyone that wants to raise money for Bras Not Bom- Bombs, just just Google it. And I think she's on Facebook. And there's currently like a fundraising for the van that is broken down at the moment, which takes her to Calais with loads of equipment and physical bras and um, like panty liners for kids and um, new knickers and stuff, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, you can go and donate there. But in general, yes, I do do loads and loads of stuff um, for charities as much as I can. Um, but it is becoming more difficult <laughs> because you've got to support yourself, you know, as well. Yeah. If it's it's your your livelihood, and I can yeah. imagine it's um, being kind of creative type and, and naturally wanting to help people, it must be um, 
he must be kind of conflicted at times how much time to allocate to to doing both of those things because yeah I think yeah. we're all empaths um, but yeah but particularly creative people and like um at, you know the times was it the times or the telegraph that had recently done a list of um what they call like covid frontline um and they'd listed artists on top at like 71 percent and I have to say um Yes, I'm asked like on a daily, um, sometimes multiple on a daily to do things for free. Um, and sometimes that's from people that don't value what you do. But sometimes it's that they do value what you do, but they just don't know how to go about getting it. Yeah. So it's really difficult when you're faced with that dilemma of how how can I feed myself and how can I help other people, mm -hmm. especially when you're stretched or spread quite thinly. There's only so many that you can help, you know. So you've always, yeah, you've got to kind of weigh it up. Because you're on your own, aren't you, ultimately? It's like yeah. you you manage everything. Um, you do all the work. You have to manage kind of distribution. You need to manage, like, marketing, everything. Yeah. There's um, no pension. There's no sick day. There's no holiday pay. So I guess it's just, um, do you ever have to have kind of quite frank conversations with people and just say, look, you know, I, I would love to do this for free, but... I can't. <laughs> yeah, all the time. And um, and I also have conversations with people where I don't actually answer their question. Um, and I very politely kill them with kindness and point them in the right direction. In fact, I had one last night. Um, I think it was like midnight. A woman uh, was asking um, for help with her husband who wanted to be an artist. And it was a really difficult thing to have to do in public to and I can't you can't help someone in a couple of sentences and it was all just a, a bit confused and you know I answered very diplomatically um but like recently I raised money with my sort of sister company beer mat doodles we doodle on beer mats of people um and a local like really good friend of mine um was doing the open soup kitchen for covid and she was doing it with a local pub and again I know the owners lovely people and she was like, can I have a portrait to auction? And I was like, girl, I can't afford it. Like, portraits are huge. I can't. So then, but I was able to, like, ask for donations whilst we were beer mat doodling. So all the team, we were all raising money for the soup kitchen thing because we could figure out a way of doing it. So it's like, there's always a way of doing it. You've just got to think outside the box. So, you know, even if it's a tiny amount, you might not be able to do what they're asking you to do you can help in some way you can share yeah. a post you can whatever yeah yeah 100 percent. i hear you i think it's just um it's good that you have that like self-awareness um to kind of make those decisions and have those conversations because i think like it as like a younger person um you know coming up and and doing it you probably be more like naive back then definitely you, is this something that you've learned over the years to uh yeah kind of I think basically though it just boils down to well you're never going to be able to help anyone if you close your business like yeah. if you you know like, yeah um, yeah words yeah I hear that <laughs> like I know I know when my money's running out cash flow is always a problem when you're a creative and you've got like an independent business I, I worked I think for three years having five jobs in total whilst doing this before I could properly let go of the reins and I think you know, when you've had to work so bastard hard for something, you don't, yeah. you know, you realise what that charity thing is asking you, really. It's, do you want to close your business next month for me? And the answer is, I can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair play. <laughs> but um, in addition to kind of everything, all the art that you do, you also have an award-winning illustration blog. Um, I do, that's hilarious. <laughs> do you want me to fill you in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, how impactful has that been in kind of, like, getting Mate. your art out there? <laughs> Listen, right, so I went and did, um, <laughs> I went and did, like, a creative business course that Nottingham City had offered to try and give you tips. And they were like, yeah. you have to write a blog. If you don't write a blog, your SEO will go down, your business will fail. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll write a fucking blog. So I was writing this blog and it would take a day out of my week every single time. And I was like, right, I'm cutting the blog down to once a month because this yeah. is a lot out of my day. And so I was doing it for once a month and I was like, God, this, I hate my blog. I hate it. Like, 
there's no joy in it. I can't think of anything worse than sitting it. Who wants to know about my bloody month anyway? No one cares about me. I, this is ridiculous. I did it because I knew that it would bump my SEO up. And it has, to be fair. Like, you know, it's worked. And then this company out of the blue, which was called Blogspot, I think, emailed me and just was like, you ha- have won an award for the best illustration blog out of 100, I think you're number like 87 or something. And I was like, you are shitting me. <laughs> My blog is terrible. So, but let me tell you, I put it on every CV. I have stopped writing the blog as soon as I got that award. If you look on my web- website, it's like me with the award and then that's it. See you later, everyone. I'm oh, going to go and that. paint. Yeah, so, fuck yeah, you to um, the man, isn't it? It's just like, yeah, I did it because I had to. But um, there, was one, there was one bit on the blog though because I was obviously, I had a little scroll through it and... Um, yeah. Uh, there's you pictured with the real life sheriff of Nottingham, and I'm not gonna lie, like yes. I legit thought, and this is this is showing how dumb I actually am. Uh, I legit thought he was just a character in like the Robin Hood universe. I was just like, no, we really have one. Shit, you've actually got a sheriff. Yeah, I wrote um, that <laughs> every yeah, day. Yeah, we've a got day. a sheriff. We've got a mayor, and we've got a sheriff, and they've both got different chain things. Yeah, we're proper like. Yeah, oh, proper right. Nottingham. I thought, I thought it was just like in a historical context. I thought like Sheriff of Nottingham <laughs> was someone who lived years ago in like olden times, but I didn't realise you actually had one now. I thought that was pretty sick. <laughs> I was in, I was walking, yeah, I was walking into town and I was on a video call, which we hate, um, <laughs> going into Nottingham city centre with somebody that was from the States. Now, I can't remember who it was. But anyway, I was walking into town and we have our kind of town hall but we call it in Nottingham the council house so Mm -hmm. I turned the phone around was like oh and here's the council house and he went hey isn't a council house like um you know like project housing how come your town hall is a council house and I was like oh no we just call we call you know there's so many weird things that we do in Nottingham like we have a sheriff but the sheriff doesn't police anyone. But uh, idiosyncrasies and different. Yeah. <laughs> it is weird, isn't it? Yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's all very kind of archaic, isn't it? Stuff like Barry. that, like having a sheriff, and it's does he? What does he actually do? He doesn't really he just, do anything. He just, just turns an arbitrary up, kind of position. Cuts ribbons. Given. Yeah. Ah, fair enough. Easy gig. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't yeah. turn it down. Do you know what I mean? Has he exactly. been furloughed? Do you think? I, w- I would reckon that they've all been furloughed, yeah. I saw the ex-sheriff of Nottingham the other day at the BLM protest, and he yeah. wasn't wearing a chain or anything, and he wasn't wearing a suit. He was just like, you know, as he was. And I was desperate to be like, are you okay? Is your job still <laughs> Where's your- Is your job still there? Like, who's the next sheriff? Are they still working? But I didn't want to offend him, so I just sort of let him go. Yeah, I mean, we talked a bit about the um, like the BLM protests in Nottingham, and, and they yeah. popped up everywhere in the country. It's incredible. Um, yeah. So you got yourself down there. Um, I saw yeah. like um, Jugs did a like a talk as well, didn't he? I saw on social media he did like a speech or something. I think that was the original BLM that happened six years ago. That speech. Oh, was it? Um, uh, I see. Yeah, and I think he um, reshared somebody... it, so that's probably why. Yeah, yeah. He, <laughs> I think somebody had turned it with a placard. Um, with his lyrics on as well so I think he was trying to say like this is what I was saying and this is the song really and you know this is the thing but yeah um it was really peaceful it was really uh moving and it was a huge turnout and it didn't last very long you know it was only sort of two and a half hours I think it wasn't like a whole day of sort of stomping around or whatever yeah um and I didn't stay for that so it was at um our local park to make sure that we're all maintaining social distancing um, and afterwards, I think everyone walked into town um, and went to the council house, so our town hall. Um, and recently, there was another one where everyone took the knee outside the council house. So um, we've got a really strong movement and incredibly proud of my city, basically, because we're all sort of pulling together. So, yeah, it's it's really good. Well, and those incredible. The girls that started that kind of grassroots mo- movement of it um, and that got everybody together and like our lo- local MP, Nadia Whitome, you know, she was there. The whole thing was just brilliant. It was just really well organised, perfect. That's amazing. Really encouraging to hear, you know, that there's such a good turnout. And I think especially within like like the hip hop community, you know, like everyone yeah. um, for the most part 
has been you know unified and and coming together and and speaking out and um and doing their part i think you know however you do that um so long as you're making the change you know uh, absolutely as, to the best of your ability um but no i really you know respect the fact that you got it out there and did that yeah but, um so what's um what's next in terms of like i'm I guess you're obviously like busy all the time with like commissions and various projects and pieces going on. But um, mm. is there anything kind of hip hop related in the pipeline? Um, Weirdly today, right. Okay. So today I'm sharing um, an album cover that I did in 2018 for an album that's going to be released on July the 4th um, by D Prince. Who, so he's like a Brooklyn uh, rapper uh-huh. and he's releasing an album called um, Handsome Villain. So the album cover that I did is really different from what I normally do. So I'm releasing a picture of that today and hopefully we'll see how that goes down. Oh, but nice. yeah, handsome villains coming out. So that's massive. Um, the thing that I've turned around so that you can't see, that's big news. That's big secret news that's coming. I know. Okay. Oh, come on. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Delicious hip hop nuggets. And then I've got maybe about kind of four months time around Christmas. I'm working on another massive thing that's hip hop related and the clue that I'll give you is that it is a portrait of somebody hip hop related okay. for the person that it's of okay and it will probably end up being shared at some point as I I don't know an item of something that's all I'm going to say I'm intrigued I can't wait to see it it's but, um, very exciting because you're also um involved in you know the streetwear blue cheese like big nasty yeah. guys like that so you yeah. talk a bit more about that because um when we first started doing this podcast we were like talking so much more about streetwear um and it kind of like fell off by the wayside because like for whatever reason um as jake our kind of like resident streetwear guru is just like <laughs> always busy and too off busy yeah even even now he's too busy do you know what i mean it's <laughs> too busy but during the pandemic man He's but, um, too busy for hip hop. He's too busy for streetwear. <laughs> um, right. So Blue Cheese. I don't know how much you know about Blue Cheese as a kind of clothing company, but it was started by Mr. Cheese, um, who is a Nottingham resident, born and bred. And he, what he does is he collaborates with illustrators to create mm-hmm. designs for the clothing brand, and he's worked tirelessly, pretty much in grime, uh, predominantly, um, to basically make everyone look fresh so we collaborated and we did the Lowitz t-shirt which is like um uh, kind of like a packet of chew but with a dragon with his finger up saying just low it um <laughs> and I think I did like I can't remember what else I did but I did a couple of designs anyway um and I've got some uh, female forward designs um for Mr. Cheese as well. Uh, but you can find all sorts of like collaborations with him. And he's still, you know, going amazingly. And I don't think he'll ever stop. Um, he's just, he is pretty a pretty amazing man, really, creating opportunities for loads of different designers and stuff. Um, but I haven't worked with him for, for a while. There'll be stuff coming up, but it's just as and when, really. Um, got another... Uh, design collection for Mim Clothing in Nottingham, which is kind of an independent streetwear brand. Um, I think we're doing like a little Sade t-shirt, which will be cool. Nice, nice. Um, and so, yeah, I think streetwear is a big part of um, of hip hop culture um, and street culture, basically. Um, I think the thing that I get frustrated about as a girl is that it's very rare that you can find something that's flattering, represents exactly who you are, um, especially design wise, like blokes t-shirt designs are brilliant. Like they're understated, they're clever, they're graphic. And I just don't feel represented enough female wise. Like why does it always have to be like tight lycra with no print on it? It's really frustrating or like giant, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, me and Mr. Cheese were kind of trying to figure out how Gap to... Gap in the market. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It. Why not? But it's, it's trickier than you think. Like we're talking about it and it is quite tricky, but yeah, we're going to figure out, um, yeah, something that's a bit the, more. I guess the demand for it as well, you know, it's, um, yeah. you, I mean, there must be, you know, I mean, usually it's, um, you don't realize something until you kind of like put it out to the world, you know what I mean? And then you'll realize that actually this is, this was a really good idea. 
totally and, you know and what I mean? often what happens is like you you have a passion don't you like with a brand or whatever yeah and it's just like shotgun the orcs because basically you guys got together because you all love hip-hop so you start like talking about hip-hop and you realize that that bit takes off but then you have a great idea for the streetwear side of it and you're like well there's no room anymore Do you know what <laughs> yeah, i mean like i can't much, fit yeah. it all in and like you know, I know that there was, there was probably a gap in the market for extra cool socks, but you can't always just go, yeah, I've got an illustration business, though. Like, I can't have a beer mat doodle business, an illustration bit, you know, yeah. you can't you do it all. You don't spread yourself too thin, and then, you, and then I guess... And then nothing's good, you know? Yeah, yeah, I hear you, I hear you. I guess as well, like, being an artist is very much being in the moment of what you're creating at that point in time, yes. do you know what I mean? And it needs your full focus and energy. Yes, definitely. It's hard enough to run the practical sides of my business when I'm painting a painting, you know, yeah. let alone like the house doesn't get tidied when I'm on. a. In fact, right now, when I'm on a difficult project that's massive, you know, it's, it's awful, terrible. Like I can't, I can't, Artist I can't life, do it, it? All. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, it's it's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you, um, oh, and you, Emily. And um, before we wrap up, is there anything that you want to plug or anyone you want to shout out? No, just shout out to everyone. Hi, everyone. Thanks for <laughs> listening this long. <laughs> <laughs> but um, where can people find your um, your website, your blog? Where can people see your art and uh, find you on socials? So uh, my website is www.emilycatherineillustration.com. I'm Emily Catherine Illustration on Facebook and on Instagram and I'm EC Illustrates on Twitter and my YouTube is called Emily Catherine Illustration. I think that's it. Awesome. Yeah, go go and check out Emily Catherine Illustration. Extremely talented and um, I think there's something for everyone there, especially if you're a hip-hop fan. So go and check it out. So um, we've been Shotgun the Orcs at Shotgun the Orcs, all platforms, um, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that jazz. Go follow, subscribe, like if you want to. And we're out. It's been a pleasure.